Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have with us returning guest, Aaron Smith-Levin. Aaron, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Jeff. Aaron, you have been on fire with the videos you've been doing. I think they're remarkable. They give uh, Scientology watchers a rare glimpse inside of the Church of Scientology that we seldom get to see. And today we're going to go through a very little known or understood aspect of the Church of Scientology called the Freeloader Bill. Could you tell our listener what the Freeloader Bill is all about? Sure. So <clears throat> in short, a Freeloader Bill is, um, is a bill that somebody gets when they leave staff before their contract is up or when they leave the Sea Org um, ever uh, because your contract can never be up in the Sea Org. So it's a bill that someone is given when they either leave staff or leave the Sea Org um, prior to contract expiration, and it, it's, it, it's billing them for the full price, no discounts, no IAS discounts or anything like that, the full price of any training or auditing they ever had um, as a staff member or a Sea Org member ever. Um, uh, you know, one of the, well, that's a definition, so we can leave it at that, but, you know, one, one of the draws to joining staff for many Scientologists um, is the potential to do your bridge for free, at least while you're on staff. And there are a number of people who join staff thinking, um, you know, it's sort of the, it's sort of the work study way to go up the bridge. Um, and so, but you know, if things happen and someone leaves staff before their either two and a half or five year contract is up, or if they leave the Sea Org, they're billed full price for everything. And, and it's routine, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars is, uh, is a common freeloader bill. Okay, now Aaron, question for uh, our new Scientology watchers. As I understand it, there's three basic uh, levels in the Church of Scientology. You have public members mm -hmm. who pay full price to go up the bridge. Mm -hmm. And then you have staff members who sign either a two and a half year or five year contract. And then Sea Org members who sign for the full billion years, correct? Correct. Okay, so if I'm Joe Q Public and I can't afford the $360,000 plus bridge to total freedom, if I sign a 2.5 or five year contract, I can get some free auditing, correct? Technically, yes. Um, you know, what, what the, the, the way it works is you're supposed to be on staff for um, a certain number of, of hours and you're supposed to get about 12 and a half hours of study time per week, right? Now that study right. time is primarily used so that you can do the courses that you're supposed to do to be trained for your job. Like it's not like, you join staff and the next day you're doing auditor training. Um, you have to be trained to do the post that you're assigned to in the org first. So that's one of the ironies of these freeloader debts is they include the courses that you were doing just to learn how to be a staff member. Um, now, I wanna throw in one thing just because I'm not sure I've ever heard it clearly explained to the public at large and that's why would anyone sign a five-year contract at an org instead of a two and a half year contract? I just wanna really quickly explain that. Sure. So it's the difference between if you're going on a technical post that requires um, auditor or supervisor training, or if you're going on an administrative post like, um, I don't know, receptionist or registrar or anything other than auditor or supervisor, right? Um, if you go, if you're gonna be an auditor or a supervisor, you have to go on full-time training in order to become that. In order to go on full-time training, you have to agree that when you finish your training, you'll be on staff for five years. So if you're just gonna be an administrative staff member, nobody would ever sign a five-year contract. That, that means you are going into full-time training. Um, that's probably all there is to say about that, really. And the same would apply to Sea Org. Your, your initial training in the Sea Org is on how to be a Sea Org member and how to do your job? Yes, your initial training is always, always, always for your job. Um, even if you are going into full-time training to be an auditor, the first courses you do are still going to be the basic training on uh, just how to be a Sea Org member and you know how to do Sea Org missions and stuff like that. What we have for our listeners, this is pretty exciting. We have uh, podcast companion documents, and these will be posted by Tony Ortega and at the Scientology Money Project. The first document to which I draw the uh, listeners' attention is the uh, Excel document called Freeloader Debt. And Aaron, this is your spreadsheet you prepared for, uh, it, it itemizes everything you were charged for in your freeloader bill. Now, for people who are at the gym or driving their cars, don't worry, we're gonna read out line items and you can look at the document at your leisure. So this spreadsheet is amazing to me 
And let's just begin at the very beginning, upper left-hand corner, you know, where you have CLO, FLO, and go from there. I mean, <laughs> if, I'm read if I'm reading this right, uh, the total freeloader bill you got is $59,000. Um, no, that's you're probably adding together the total and then the with discount. Um, the, to oh, I'm seeing. the total for me on, on the left side of the spreadsheet is 32950 And then after... Um, the discounts that I was proposing uh, for, for the discounts here, it might've been like, we're, I have to, I have to reorient my attention to what that was because normally there are no discounts. Right. But sometimes, um, on certain parts of the year, like let's say it's LRH's birthday and, um, the birthday event is coming near, they'll, they'll promote some sort of like, um, limited time only, you know, 20, whatever you pay, will credit you 20% of what you paid, things like that. Um, so I free, I'd have to crunch the math here to see how much of a discount this is offering, but that's why it's there. I probably, yeah, look, this is a 20% discount. Um, okay. Yeah, it's 20% discount. And so I was in this Sea Org for four years. I was already a trained supervisor, a trained word clearer. Um, I was not yet a trained auditor. So in four years, after four years of uh, dedicated service to the Sea Org, they gave me a bill for $33,000. Um, you'll see over on the right side of the spreadsheet, my wife who was in the Sea Org for 16 years, she was handed a bill for $129,300. <laughs> That's just jaw dropping to say the least. So in other words, uh, I'm the Church of Scientology. You come and give me your life work, you know, uh, 12 to 18 hours a day, seven days a week. And then at the end of your service, when you leave, I'm going to hit you with a gigantic bill. And you're going to pay more for those services if you pay your bill in full than a public Scientologist would have paid paying for those services as a public. <laughs> you, know, you know, and I, I'm sorry to say this, but this is one reason, and this is what the Church of Scientology needs to hear. And I know they listen to these podcasts. This is why the Church of Scientology is considered an out exchange ripoff organization. Right. And in the course of the so called WOG world, you do not pay for job training. Right. You know, I was trained by, you know, I worked for two top corporations, Philips and Siemens. And the job training I received, I didn't pay for when I left those, those jobs. So it's so out of the frame of normalcy. Uh, Aaron, one time Claire Head Headley told me that Shelley Miscavige told her that they didn't really intend to collect on freeloader bills. They were a way to control people after they left the Sea Org. Mm -hmm. what, what are your thoughts on that statement? I can understand the truth in that statement, depending on who's saying it and when. I think her goal there, like if you know Shelley Miscavige, when she said that, she was the very top of the York board. So she's probably making that statement from a very big picture purpose of we don't give freeloader debts because – we want to collect. It doesn't mean we don't collect. It means that's not why we give freeloader debts. And I, I, I can understand why she would have said that at that time. But it certainly would be false to say that orgs don't attempt to collect the debts. It's certainly false to say that they don't succeed in collecting debts. Um, in fact, the entire division of three of Treasury has a statistic called collections. But realize that's different than actual income, which, which it gets brought in in Division 2. Collections is collecting on money that's owed to the org, not trying to raise money for the org. The 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 C org division three's collection statistic is almost exclusively made up of money they have collected from former C org members that they've convinced to pay towards their freeloader debt for the week. Really? Oh, absolutely. That's that when 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 um and I know because I was in charge of division four when I was in the C org for the org that I worked in. And as the head of Division Four, I was also in charge of the committee that was composed of all the division heads, right? So I knew how the Treasury Secretary, um, what they had to do to get their collection set up for the week. And they had files, hundreds and thousands of files of former Sea Org members, who, not hundreds of thousands, but hundreds, <laughs> hundreds and thousands of files of former Sea Org members who still had outstanding freeloader debts. And they would call them and email them and call them and say, um, that, that's where this discount comes into play because there was a lot of um, leeway to do things like that, especially since it's not a legitimate debt. Like people sort of know it's it's kind of a fake debt. So you can wheel and deal however you want to get someone to pay a little bit towards that debt that week. 
Oh, that's interesting to know. Yeah. On, okay, now going to uh, sheet one of the Excel spreadsheet. Aaron, if we look at the uh, freeloader debt, we have sheet one of the Excel spreadsheet where it's showing $32,950 mm -hmm. with discount, right? Yeah. Now, I want to go through uh, just basically CLO Western US. Mm -hmm. And can you can you just take us through these steps and, you know, how to make work easier, $100? Mm -hmm. Is this when you begin uh, your Sea Org training? So I'm gonna, there, there's two categories of very, very basic types of courses. And I might not even be able to completely remember how they separate out, but I'll explain them briefly. Um, there's a series of courses that you do when you start the EPF. So the EPF stands for Estates, Project Force, and to put it very simply, it's just Sea Org Boot Camp, um, depending on how much prior experience you have in Scientology and how many courses you've already done. It could take anywhere from a few days to a few months. Um, I had already done uh, pretty much, I had already studied all of the LRH material that was on the check sheets for those courses previously. So I literally did the EPF in like three or four days. Um, some people spend three to six months on it. It just depends. Um, okay, so they're very, very basic courses. For example, welcome to the Sea Org. Um, uh, I'm reading these here, and to be honest, I can't remember which ones are on the EPF and which ones are, oh, I got ahead of myself. The EPF courses in the Sea Org are referred to as product zero. Okay, that's, okay. that's just what they're, it's product zero is another word for the EPF. And so there's a series of basic courses. It's five or six of them called Product Zero courses. Once you finish the EPF and you're posted as a Sea Org member, you now have what's called Product One. And it's just another series of courses that are very, very basic, except now they're teaching you how to do things like do a Sea Org mission. So you'll, on this list here, you'll see somewhere the Mission School Third Class, um, the basic Sea Org member hat, the basic cleaning course. Those are Product One courses, I can recall. Um, how to make work easier might have even been a product one course. Um, so introduction to Scientology ethics, that is a product zero course, that's on the EPF. Sea Org etiquette, that's also product zero. Personal grooming course, that's also product zero. And keys to competence is also product zero. Um, and on these courses, you're reading flag orders. You're reading flag orders and policy letters, but you know, flag order is really just another type of policy written by LRH that's only applicable to Sea Org members. It's not applicable to Scientology at large. Well, let me take two of these that, that, that stand out to me. The personal grooming course, mm -hmm. they charge you $500 for personal grooming. Is there like a Sea Org way of personal grooming? <laughs> um, so the things that you would read on the personal grooming course is things like how to tie a tie. <laughs> um, how to, uh, you know, guidelines for uh, what a, if, if a Sea Org member is going to have a beard, it must be neatly trimmed. You know, maybe some some example photos of uh, Sea Org members from the 1970s. Uh, very, very <laughs> funny looking at them from today's yeah. perspective. Um, it's not like, here's how you take a shower. Um, it, it would have, this is the course where it would tell you things like um, why you're not allowed to wear heavy perfume um, or scented deodorant, things like that. You know, it keys in like Holtrex incidents and awesome stuff like that. <laughs> um, uh, but, but go ahead. You're going to ask a question. Well, yeah. The, well, the second one is the Sea Org etiquette course. Yes. So if it's, what is if it's, $500 for Sea Org etiquette, what do you learn in that course? So that's where you learn things that are incredibly applicable to being at sea on a ship. Like if you're in a walkway, I forget what the walkway is that, for on a ship because I've really never been on one. Um and two people are approaching each other at a doorway, and one person is holding a heavy load, it is proper manners to step out of the way. So that was worth $500. Um, that's the also, this is where they explain that all, all Sea Org members are called, all, all Sea Org officers are called Sir, regardless of whether they're male or female. Um, it also, there's a whole policy called, it's FO38, Flag Order 38, called manners. So if you've ever heard or been screamed at by a Sea Org member, who is saying, you're being out FO38 or get your FO38 in. Um, and I, I can't help but be reminded by the Tom Cruise interview that was done uh, within the last year where he, he scolded the Australian reporter that was interviewing him who was asking him about his relationship with Nicole Kidman. And he said, put your manners in. <laughs> that is only something a Sea Org member would say. 
That's not proper. That's not something Scientologists say in day to day conversation. That is something they say in the Sea Org, though. Get your manners in. <laughs> or or you're, you're you're out fo thirty eight. Out fo thirty eight. I mean, thank God he didn't say that to the reporter. That would have been an incident. Um, but um, so let's see. I mean, what else on the the Sea Org? How, well, how about here's something I, no, I noticed. Let's just jump on quickly away from etiquette Go ahead. thank you Go ahead. thank you i'm sorry my <laughs> fo38 was out um the, the two other courses uh data series evaluator course yes now scientologists i know have tended to make a big deal out of this like mm -hmm. i'm a data series evaluator i know as if that means that they're they are critical thinkers at the top of the world i know i know i know i know and and, and I'll, t I, I'll, I'll tell you something i was sharing with a um Scientologist. I said, look, one reason people get mad at Scientology, I spent four years at a university having to do, you know, the work it takes to get a college degree. Doctors spend eight to 12 years, right? And Scientology glibly dismisses people with college degrees. They dismiss doctors as medicos, mm -hmm. psychologists or psychiatrists as head shrinkers, mm -hmm. lobotomists, right? And they say, I've taken the data series evaluator course. That's all I need to know. As if that trumps a college education or critical thinking. What exactly is the data series evaluator course? Okay. So there's the elementary data series evaluators course, and there's the executive data series evaluators course. And I did the elementary one, which in itself is pretty freaking long. Um, I mean, it's a couple inches thick of, you know, paper. So um, how do I explain this? There is, uh, you, you know, in all the policy letters that LRH wrote, uh, he, he broke a good portion of them out into different series, right? So there might be a policy letter that at the top says, this is part of the, exec this is executive series 13, and this is organization series 9, and this is data series 33. So like policy letters were assigned to certain series that he thought all, um, you know, were uh, part of one subject, right? So the, the elementary data series evaluators course is really just reading through all of the policies that LRH said belonged to the data series. And that's policies, the subject of which were geared towards how to analyze and interpret and evaluate data. And, you know, I gotta be honest, it's not an easy, it was not an easy course for me. Um, there, the whole course is based on some uh, a, a very major premise that you already know what the perfect ideal situation for any particular activity is supposed to be. Well, that's, um, I don't know. Uh, I guess you have to be comfortable to say, I know the exact ideal situation that something is supposed to be. And then you're supposed to take that. They've got a list. And we're gonna, to, to fully describe this is not quite possible because of the the whole um, new category of terminology that's been created to describe these things, okay? So there's a policy that has all the out points and all the plus points. And I don't even want to get into describing out points and plus points, but out point would be anything that's a departure from the ideal scene, and a plus point would be anything that aligned with the ideal scene. And, you know, you're supposed to walk in, you're supposed to really walk into an org, and if you've already studied all the policy that LRH wrote, then in your mind, conceptually, you do... Um, sort of know what the ideal situation is supposed to be in an org, right? You know how things are supposed to look. You know how things are supposed to be working. You're supposed to be able to go into that org or go through the, the data files for that org and read all of the reports and look at all of the statistics and read all the knowledge reports that all the staff have written on each other. And you're supposed to be able to isolate the single biggest reason why this org is having trouble. And, and then you're supposed to put a program together on how to handle that thing. So the, the whole idea here is you're taking something that's not ideal and you're putting a program together for how to move it um, so that it's more ideal. And I guess ideal is a word that Scientology loves to use, as we know from all the ideal orgs and everything like that. Um, but the original use of the word ideal in Scientology, the most popular use was probably the ideal scene. And the ideal scene is for any activity organization, um, what would it look like if it was perfect? And um, the whole purpose of the, uh, studying the data series and doing um, uh, evaluations um, using the data series is to make orgs more approach their ideal scene. And it, uh, ironically enough, even within Scientology, doing uh, the data series and doing evaluations on orgs has completely fallen out of use. So even if someone does ascribe 
to this course as being um, super valuable and that the activity of doing eval evaluations um, is very valuable. It's not even done in Scientology anymore by management. Well, this is, this is interesting. It raises two observations on my part. One, listening to you talk, you, I see a density of Scientology language, mm -hmm. which already tends to, to shape and mold uh, a person's thinking because plus points, minus points, ideal scene. Oh yeah. You know, you, 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 you can, the listener can easily hear how the language is already changing. Totally. Now, the second thing that I thought of when you were describing data series evaluation, going into an org, evaluating it. When I was in college, uh, I worked at Radio Shack part-time and I sold the early TRS-80 computers. And I actually sold a lot of them, I made pretty good money. But the point is I worked at Radio Shack and there was literally the same thing. Each Radio Shack had a series of, of uh, notebooks to have like an ideal Radio Shack. <laughs> there you go. And no, we did. It was like, this is what this is what an ideal Radio Shack store should be, do, have, you know, to use a Scientology term. Mm -hmm. And we were, they had planograms, how to stock, what to stock, stocking levels, yep. and pr promotional materials, catalogs, because Radio Shack used to be famous for giving out catalogs, mm -hmm. taking names and addresses of customers. And uh, every once in a while, the district manager of the district I worked in, I worked in the store at the Mall of Orange, the district manager would pop in unannounced with some guy from headquarters in Fort Worth, you know, from Tandy One headquarters. Mm -hmm. And we would, they would spend all day there making sure we were in compliance with what the ideal Radio Shack store should be like. And we got a report card. <laughs> and if we, if we got flunked on certain things, like you don't have enough of this or that, or you're, you know, I don't like how your window displays are and you're not doing this and your tie's crooked, your shoes aren't shined we would get flunked and we would have like two weeks to bring the Radio Shack store into compliance and there was a reinspection. And the reason I mention this, Aaron, it, it, and uh, people don't understand how Scientology is somewhat like uh, a retail store mm -hmm. an org, and an org sells a certain product. Yeah. And so they want like a franchise or store, they want it up to a certain amount of standardization. And so you as a Sea Org member are expected to go in and see why this is not an ideal Scientology org. Right. Absolutely. Permission. You have to build. So really, it's it, it's not a lot different than inspecting any other sort of business operation, is it? No, I would agree with you completely. Oh, that's thank you. I mean, yeah. that's just something I want to clarify yeah, yeah. because I I mean, and, I and to put it, I mean, I know this isn't the point of um of the subject we're talking about right now, but the an evaluation. The it, it used to be in Scientology that an org would actually very much want to receive an evaluation because being on staff in an org can very easily devolve into just uh, just handling what's immediately in front of you and not necessarily um, being able to work off long-term planning and you know just putting out fires, handling emergencies, and always you know just uh, addressing the wheel that's squeaking the loudest, and that can be frustrating. So, you know, orgs would actually ask management, continental management or middle management, can you? You please do an eval on, uh, which is what they call an evaluation on our org, and then they would put a plan, an approved plan, which would actually be approved by RTC. And the purpose would be so that the org could just follow the plan and know that they were making strides uh, that would help them in the long term, as long as they would just do A, B, C, and D, as opposed to just running around figuring out what they're supposed to do today. And so it was a really way to give orgs guidance. On, it, it was it was a way to provide them with long term planning as laid out by management, and that's um and and it used to be that an eval could have has to be done for a specific org because each org suffers from unique problems because they have people, and now what's happening in Scientology is all of the programs for Scientology are put out by David Miscavige, and all orgs in the world are operating on the same program. For example, the Ideal Org program. Well, every org in the world is operating on the Ideal program. Maybe there's some orgs in the world for which that's a bad plan. Yet, because everyone's operating on the same plan, they're not really allowed to opt out. So that's kind of what I mean when I said evaluations um, as a tool by Scientology management have com completely fallen into disuse. So or, and we could also say that the uh, in the old days, they 
they customized an evaluation to that particular org, or now they just have a uh, uh, sort of a McDonald's franchise standard. Yep, exactly. By definition, an evaluation could only really be done on a specific org. I mean, at least, you know what I mean? Like you would never do an evaluation. If you did an evaluation on the continent, then the program, you would only give it to the management org in the continent. You would never give the same program to every org. Like by definition, that's not what an evaluation is. So I think you get the idea. Would it be fair to say that David Miscavige's ideal org program is sort of a one-size-fits-all Scientology? Uh, absolutely, yeah. And that tends to stifle innovation, creativity, problem-solving at the local level. Absolutely, because anyone who comes up with any really good, unique, applicable idea for their area is really just seen to be cross-ordering what David Miscavige has already said should be done. Well, you can't, you know, it's hard to fight City Hall. The, another interesting thing uh, that you have to do on training, I notice, is the PTSP course. Yes. Potential Trouble Source Suppressive Person. Yes. So as part of your training as a Sea Org member, you have to learn how to identify PTS people, suppressives, confront and shatter. Sure. Now, this PTSSP course that you see on my CLO West US Freeloader Debt was not something that was done on the, on the EPF, on Product Zero. And it wasn't part of product one. There was a period where I was between orgs. I was between Asher Day and AOLA. And, um, and, and in that limbo period, technically, I was a CLO staff member on full-time study. And as a part of that full-time study, I was redoing the PTSSP course. And so, that it, you know, it, it, because I was training to become the cramming officer at AOLA. So very briefly... Cramming officer is just someone who helps auditors figure out what they might have done wrong in a session or supervisors figure out what they might have done wrong with a student. Um, and AOLA is the Advanced Organization of Los Angeles. That's um, one of the big blue buildings that delivers the OT levels in Los on L. Ron Hubbard Way. So that's why I was doing the PTSSP course there. Aaron, let's uh, let's divert for a moment to the PTSSP course. Mm -hmm. Tom Cruise famously said on the leaked Go to Guns video, someday I hope someone says, have you ever seen an SP? <laughs> well, maybe maybe someday there will only be a museum. Right. Now, this PTSSP course, what does it do? What's the whole purpose of it within okay. uh, Scientology? <clears throat> so the PTSSP course is supposed to be the professional level course on the subject of suppressive people and potential trouble sources. Uh, PTS means potential trouble source. There are plenty of other courses in Scientology where this data is covered, um, but they're usually uh, shorter and quicker and they don't go into quite as much, much depth on the background data of what makes a suppressive person suppressive and what, what allows a PTS person to go PTS in the first place and all this kind of stuff. So the, the purpose of it is to um, oh, 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 this is actually, there's a really great answer to this question. Um, if someone does not achieve results with Scientology auditing, if somebody does not get better, then it is said that it is because they are either PTS or SP. They're either a suppressive person or they're connected to a suppressive person. And that is the only reason why anyone ever could get worse in life after having previously gotten better. So you have, to, you have to get a sense. I think it's very important for non-Scientologists to get a sense of why Scientologists spend so much time talking about and thinking about the subject of SPs and suppressive people. Um, because you're also dealing with a subject that, to a large degree, uh, is bullshit and doesn't work. <laughs> and so Scientologists are constantly witnessing and seeing people who don't get better in auditing or who were really high on the bridge and then let's say got cancer. Well, they're either an SP or they're PTS. I mean, if you're really high on the bridge, then of course you're probably PTS and not an SP. But they use this technology that LRH wrote, these bulletins on the subject of what a suppressive person is and what a potential trouble source person, what a potential trouble source is to explain away every accident that ever happens to someone um, every, they call every roller coaster. Roller coaster essentially means you might even call it uh, a depression would be considered a roller coaster. Okay, it's an emotional roller coaster. When people are doing poorly in life, whereas before they were doing well, like you know, let's, maybe someone hits a rough patch and they're struggling, that would be considered a roller coaster. They were doing good, now they're doing bad. When that happens to someone in Scientology, it said it's because they're PTS, and there's no other reason. 
So people are constantly being put on the meter by ethics officers to find out who they're PTS to. Well, now this is this fascinates me for two reasons. Again, uh, going back to my work at Radio Shack in college, right? Mm-hmm. We followed a policy where if you bought a Radio Shack product and you weren't happy, we cheerfully refunded your money. But in Scientology, if I use Scientology logic, if you came into my Radio Shack store and you wanted to return a clock radio, Mm -hmm. I would want to know why you're suppressive. What crimes do you have on Radio Shack? Aaron, what what crimes do you have on Radio Shack? (laughs) And then I would have to look at your your bad indicators. Right. You know, what withholds do you have on Radio Shack that you're wanting to return this product? For for me, and this is a a reducto ad absurdum, reducing it to the ridiculous or the absurd. Mm -hmm. Scientology doesn't stand behind the products that it offers and sells. And it inevitably invalidates the customer or client, right? Right. And, And Jason McGay famously made a point of this in his interviews with Mark Bunker, that, you know, if you build a car that's a pile of crap, me as the automotive dealer, I'm going to make you buy a new one and I'm going to make you wrong right. on top of it. Right. So so I think that, that it's, it's real interesting. And you use the word, L. Ron Hubbard created this body of technology. But within that logic, it's actually a tautology. What, if you're not what did, winning What does in tautology so- mean? I don't know what that means. Okay. A tautology is a circular argument. Okay. In other words, I'll give you the most, one of the most famous circular arguments or tautologies out there is the Bible is the word of God because it says it is. Mm-hmm. Well, now look at the logic of this. You can't argue with a tautology. Right. Okay. The Bible is the word of God because it says it is. It's, it's, it's a circular argument. Right. Okay. Right? So to say that the reason a person is not getting better with Scientology is because they're PTS or SP. This too is a philosophically said to be a tautology. In other words, it's it you, you can't argue. It just goes around in circles, right? Well, then let me close that loop for you, so you can th- to 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 make your point even stronger. How it's even more of a tautology. So Please. there's also what's called false PTS and pretended PTS. Okay. <laughs> okay. So but, so because Elridge specifically said that the only cause of any accident is being PTS, but being false PTS also falls into that category. It qualifies. So what makes someone false PTS? There's about four or five reasons. I'm not sure I'll remember them all, but one way you can be false PTS is to have overts. Another way you can be false PTS is to have misunderstood words. Another way you can be false PTS, and this closes the loop, general lack of Scientology basics on how to handle life. So not knowing enough Scientology is one of the ways that you can be <laughs> false PTS. So it can not knowing enough Scientology can be why Scientology audit didn't work enough for you. <laughs> it's, it's a little ridiculous. But the other well here let me let me just just play with this. Hubbard also had a thing called a hidden standard. Right. And when I first heard of it, it it's a hidden standard means uh, let's say someone got some auditing and they were really wanting to improve their eyesight and it didn't happen, but they didn't say that. Mm-hmm. Hubbard would say, oh, you had a hidden standard. Right. Your own, only judgment that auditing worked is if it fixed your eyesight when we never said we were going to fix your eyesight. And maybe we helped you, you know, talk better to people. And it did help you, but you don't think it helped you because you already had a fixed idea of what help meant. And, and then in addition to a false PTS, and I'm not a tech person, but there's uh, some other phenomena that mimics a floating needle. It's a, like a false floating needle. An ARC break needle. Oh, thank you. Yeah, can you? Now, this this is where Scientology just, it's hard to follow. So you can have a floating needle, which is good, <laughs> but you can also have an ARC floating needle, which is bad. An ARC break needle. Yeah, all, oh. all that means is the needle appears to be floating, but the preclear doesn't look happy. <laughs> Because they've had an ARC break, which means well, what is an AR? Well, uh, basically, uh, well, A is affinity, R is reality, which just means agreement. C is communication. So an ARC break is just means either something. Ha- it basically means you're upset. It means you're upset with someone or something, right? So an, an, an example of uh, an ARC break would be uh, you don't like someone right now. So that's a break of affinity. 
reality. Or you completely disagree with someone about something and it therefore is making you not like them. So that would be a break in reality because you disagree. Or let's say you've been trying to talk to someone and they've been blowing you off and so it's kind of pissing you off. So that the break in communication led to uh, a breaking in you know reality and affinity. So, but but essentially the concept of ARC break is you're upset. That's literally ARC break means upset, angry, not cool. Um, so if the meter happens to be floating, I mean the needle happens to uh, be doing a floating needle motion, and the preclear is crying, then it would be uh, uh, out tech incorrect application of the technology uh, to indicate that the needle is floating because it's not considered a true FN. That is just uh, amazing, and this is why you need training to be an auditor to figure this out, right? Sure, and to be honest, there's and, and, no true explanation, uh, and, and I know because I've studied it all. There's no technical explanation for why the needle would float when a PC is crying. It's just said that's not a true floating needle, so don't indicate it as one. Getting back to the freeloader bill, yeah, you got charged three thousand two hundred seven dollars for the clear certainty rundown. Uh, that must be on my wife's side. Where is that? Oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, it is. It's on your wife's side. It's on uh, column I. Oh yeah, I see it. But but this clear certainty rundown, people attest to clear. That's what you want to become a clear and then move on to the OT levels. Mm -hmm. What is the clear certainty rundown? And I thought when you became clear originally, you were certain you were clear, and that's why you attested. So help me out here. Why do you have to take the CCRD? So the clear certainty rundown is a very short auditing action that is um, supposed to be used to determine and verify that someone has achieved the state of clear and to rehabilitate the state if needed. Now, my understanding of that when I was in the Sea Org was completely different than my understanding of that now because I didn't know what the clear cognition was when I was in the Sea Org, and I do now. And I don't know if you want me to say it on this podcast, but we don't have to for now. Um, no, we're on a pod. We're on a podcast. Please let listeners know what the clear cognition okay, great. is. Just you know, this is one of one of the uh, aside from the uh, the clear cognition and the Zenu story are the two most highly confidential and secret things in Scientology. Period. Um, and the clear cognition is supposed to be the realization that someone has that indicates they have truly achieved the state of clear. Or, or actually, this realization brings about the state of clear. And that is the following. I just realized that I have been mocking up or creating my own reactive mind this whole time. And I'm not doing it anymore. <laughs> that is the cognition that someone is supposed to say. Now, realize, pre-clears don't know that this is what the auditor is waiting to hear. And most auditors who are auditing someone on newer era Dianetics, they also do not know that this is what the pre-clear is supposed to say because the only place you learn this is on the CCRD delivery course. There's a specific course on how to deliver the CCRD. The case supervisor who's reviewing the auditing folders and the auditing uh, reports from a session, they are the ones who have done the CCRD delivery course, and they are the ones who uh, know what they're looking for in the worksheets. So if a pre-clear while getting new era Dianetics says something along those lines, that is the number one indication that this person has achieved the state of clear. Um, and when I, when I read that, that was one of, when, when I actually read what that cognition was, that was one of the most dis, uh, I, I'm going to make up a verb here, disillusioning. I don't know if that's a real word. The, one of the most disillusioning things that I had encountered um, uh, that made me go truly, even though I'd already had this uh, feeling before, truly go, oh, this is bullshit. Oh, this whole fucking thing is bullshit. Like I have, I spent the first 26 years of my life <laughs> thinking that the CCRD and the clear cog was some super high level, deep, amazing thing. Um, I would hear auditors talking about having to go through the folder and putting, uh, tabbing all the clear evidence. And I'm like, oh, clear evidence. Like, oh my God, there's actually evidence of oh, what could that possibly be? You know, when, when it looked like someone was getting ready to go on the CCRD. Um, they would go through all the worksheets and tab 
the clear evidence. And it turns out all that means was going through and putting post-it notes every place where it looked like the guy was saying something along the lines of, I just realized I've been mocking up my own reactive mind. And, and you have to say, and I'm not doing it anymore. Like you have to get both parts of it. And I was like, oh, get the hell out of here. Like all of the time that's spent teaching Scientologists about the reactive mind and the hundreds of hours that people can spend being audited on new era Dianetics to erase these engrams. And the end phenomena of the whole thing is, oh, I realized I've just been doing it myself the whole time. Oh, I just stopped. Guess what, Jeff? I just stopped mocking up my reactive mind. I guess I'm clear. Like, I couldn't even believe it when I first read that. And so, yeah, the, the auditing action, the CCRD, is really just composed of, um, well, trying to verify that the preclear actually had this realization. And then you do a procedure called date and locate. So you're trying to use the e-meter to uh, locate the exact position in space, <laughs> the exact position in time and space where the preclear was when this... Um, change occurred and his reactive mind went away. Oh, because by the way, when, when the Phaeton has that realization, the reactive mind is supposed to just completely disappear once the Phaeton realizes that. And so what you're trying to do is rehabilitate that state of how the person felt at that time when that happened. Um, because part of going clear is also, and get this, this is important, the, the realization is I'm not doing it anymore. But you could wake up tomorrow and start doing it again. So technically, a clear could mock up his reactive mind again. But he could unmock it up because he, he knows that it's, you know what I mean? Like, it's a little weird, right? It's not an absolute state, right? Um, sure. At least, you know, we're talking about in terms of Scientology. So, so, so let's say, someone, had, uh, let's say um, someone actually went clear five years ago and, and it was missed. Well, in the CCRD, they would try to rehabilitate exactly what that felt like at that time. And what the person was thinking. And, and, and of course, Scientologists just strive to be clear. It's honestly, it's a status thing. I, I, I had it myself. I, I always wanted to attest to clear. I always wanted to be a last life clear. But I honestly never had much auditing. So <laughs> they would never, they never let me actually go on to that step. But most of the friends that I had um, in the Sea Organ on staff who were my age attested to last life clear. Um, and so it was the thing to do. It was very cool to walk around with your clear bracelet. Because clears had certain, um, I'll say certain rights. That sounds a little weird. Um, there were certain courses that only clears could do. Um, there, uh, it, it's a little weird, but it was a status thing for a, for a young Scientologist growing up. Let me get esoteric here for our listeners. Hubbard discussed the Buddha a great deal, mm -hmm. and and many many people have said that Scientology borrows from Buddhism, and as and it does, and. The clear cognition, by the way, it's it's on the internet. It's it's been out there for a number of years, right. uh, in the public domain. So the idea that you've been mocking up your reactive mind and you're no longer doing it, Hubbard borrowed this conceptually. And, and I'll tell you why. When Buddha had his great enlightenment, one of the things he said is, "O oh, house builder, you have been seen. You shall not build the house again. Your rafters have been broken up. Your ridge pole is demolished too." My mind has now attained the unformed nibbana and reached the end of every sort of craving. This Buddhist insight that the house builder has been seen by the Buddha, mm -hmm. he differentiated himself from the egoic structure. Mm. And this is a very subtle part. The Buddha said the ego is a house builder and it was surrounding him and trapping him. And once he saw the house builder, it couldn't ever enclose him again. Right. Now, this is, this is quite esoteric, but these are some of the influences from which Hubbard drew upon. And if you were going to synthesize a system, you would have a house builder called the reactive mind. Right. And you would have a person realize that they they saw that activity as their own activity and they ceased doing it. I feel this is where Hubbard ripped off the Buddha. Right. Well, Jack, because it's, real quick, it's real a quick. parallel. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. know that, um, I mean, I always tend to couch things in the context of growing up in Scientology. So I'll just stick with that. Sure. Uh, growing up in Scientology, you were taught that LRH was Buddha. And it was not even a maybe, maybe it was, 
not quite sure. We were absolutely told that LRH was Buddha. And that tended, I mean, as a young person, to, to, to give a lot, of, to lend additional credibility to everything that we were studying. Is like, oh, you know, he's always talking about research into this, research into that. And, you know, there was always this kind of lingering question of, well, why, why, was, why was LRH able to figure out the whole reactive mind thing when no one else ever had? Or why was LRH able to discover the truth of OT3 when no one else had? And part of the lingering explanation that would always creep in is, oh, right, I forgot. He was Buddha. Yeah, that kind of, a, that, that's a good, that, that's actually, an ex, that's a reason why. <laughs> well, but what you're saying is so, uh, so powerful uh, in George Wittek's book, A Lucifer's Bridge, he said that Hubbard hijacked Buddhism. Now, if, and, and I could certainly, people have a great deal of reverence for the Buddha. And if you felt that Hubbard was actually the Buddha, you would uh, impute to him that same reverence people have toward the Buddha. Absolutely. But that had to be very significant. You think you have the reincarnated Buddha doing phase two. Yeah. Did, did you believe that Scientology was Buddhism phase two? Well, you have to realize I had never studied Buddhism. So, um, so it's not wasn't so much Buddhism phase two, but here's how it was explained in various references. Well, first of all, the, the exact data that LRH was Buddha comes out of the book, um, the, Hymn of A the Hymn of Asia, where he talks about, yeah, um, and, and, and he, but we have to understand. So in the Hymn of Asia, he's, he's making all sorts of references to the Buddhist, um, Buddhist texts. But I don't have any frame of reference to know whether he's accurately quoting or accurately attributing, ascribing the quotes or anything like that. So he's saying that um, according to these Buddhist texts, the Mateya was going to rise in the West with red hair and essentially, I forget all the exact wording used, but, but basically this great man will arise in the West in the, 19th, in the 1900s and with, with flaming red hair and basically... Um, finish the work that had been started. And in various um, books and lectures, Elleridge says that the only thing um, uh, that, that, that Buddhism came very close to achieving the state of clear, or it was a, a, a temporary state of clear by achieving, and again, uh, correct me if I'm uh, <laughs> destroying these words, um, by achieving Bodhi or Bodhi, and that that was yeah. essentially a temporary state of clear, and that uh, what was lacking was a way to make it permanent and a way to um, to actually reliably walk the path and achieve it predictably and and um, with, you know uh, uh, well going through a series of steps that was predictable that you could say yes if you do the steps you will achieve this um, as opposed to being very very variable for uh, from person to person so the understanding that um, I was imparted to me studying all these materials growing up in Scientology was that LRH had come back to um, finish the work he had started um, in his life as Buddha. Aaron, this this is uh, certainly something to look at. Uh, again, two things. First of all, if a Scientologist were engaged in Scientology and decided to study original Buddhism, mm -hmm. they would be disallowed to do that because that's an, uh, another practice, correct? Well, it depends on if it was just studying. Because studying about a religion wouldn't be considered another practice, but if you were attending Buddhist groups that were doing Buddhist exercises or thought exercises or anything like that, that would be a no-no. You could read whatever you wanted to read, though, if it was like considered another religion. Well, the point I was getting at is if you said, oh, uh, L. Ron Hubbard was the Buddha, I want to see what original Buddhism was about, so I'm going to do some original Buddhism, yeah. you, would not, you would not be allowed to do that. You couldn't do it, no. So, the, so the, let's make a very fine point. Like you can't meditate. So, you can't meditate in Scientology. You'll get in trouble. But So you're told that L. Ron Hubbard was the Buddha, but you're not allowed to go inspect and see what Buddhism is actually about by having some hands-on experience with it. I know. It's so funny, right? So, but again, there's, there's well, reasons why Scientologists have uh, you know, made that make, make sense to them. But, but this is Hubbard foreclosing you from actually investigating Buddhism for yourself. Right. And therefore, being able to challenge the veracity of his claim, is there any relationship between Scientology and Buddhism? Secondly, Hubbard claimed the highest state was exteriorization. And, correct? Um, the, that, the, that the highest state in Buddhism? 
No, Hubbard said the highest state in Scientology was exteriorization. Well, not necessarily. Exteriorization is something that has been promised at pretty much every single level of the bridge. The ultimate state is not just exteriorization, but also being able to fully control the messed universe just at, you know, through your thoughts. But exteriorization is something that is considered, um, it's not really a state on the bridge. Do you know what I mean? Like there's no point on the bridge where you attest to, I can now go exterior. But it is considered that once someone is exterior, that is, once someone goes exterior, that is the first time that they know truly, uh, with unshakable certainty that could never be taken away, that, that, they, that they are an immortal spiritual being. So if they have an out-of-body experience, yes. which is what exteriorization is. True. And in my whole time in Scientology, I never had that. N nor have most people had out-of-body experiences. Now, on going to Buddhism... Uh, Advaita Vedanta, other practices, having an out-of-body experience in and of itself is not considered a high state. It's considered uh, a phenomenon, and you wouldn't want to get trapped in it. As a Buddhist practitioner, if you went out of your body, you would simply notice it. Notice it, you're arising that way, and you would not react. Mm. Now, now it's 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 a certainly a uh, something to consider but you don't become attached to it or think that that you become a buddha because you you've had an out-of-body experience interesting but scientology places a great deal of emphasis on the out-of-body experience right because it's 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 a thought that that is that is that is getting closer to a thetan in its native state which is not dependent upon the body would you say that a lot of scientologists spend their lives hoping for that out-of-body experience that never comes? Well, here's here's why it's hard for me to say yes. <laughs> I spent most of my time in Scientology wondering why I was the only one. <laughs> you know? Because people are very quick to talk about going exterior. I mean, in, in ways that are slightly cringeworthy. Like, oh yeah, so I was, I, you know, I was just chilling out doing nothing, so I just exteriorized and went over to blah, 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 blah. People will talk like that. And I never wanted to say, are you fucking kidding me? Like, show me, like, do it right now. Like, I've never been exterior and I've, you know, been kind of like trying for a long time. So, um, so it's not people ne you never hear people talk about not going exterior. You only hear people talking about going exterior. Well, it, it may be, you know, an imaginative embellishment that they up engineer into exterior. Yeah. Hubbard's Hubbard's famous tape where he talks about being up there in the Van Allen radiation belt. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's looking at Nova Scotia, and the space is quite warm. Mm -hmm. Hubbard makes it seem like some sort of almost cavalier experience that he's up in the Van Allen radiation belt. Yeah. And then, and then there's he's saying that he went through a change of space process. Right. He, ne he never says process. The American he uses process. I know. Uh, that's just an aside. So. So on the subject it's, of exteriorization, let me let me. Yes. Okay, I'll give you an example, an early example, because I was only 15 years old when I heard this story. I was supervising the Philadelphia course room. We had a, a student there. He, I considered him a friend. His name was Scott. Um, he was literally a rocket scientist. Okay, it's what he did, and he got into Scientology and very quickly spent a lot of money to go up the bridge very quickly and do like all the L rundowns and stuff like that. So he was telling me a story of how he was in session on one of the the L rundowns and he went completely exterior for, and it was like one of the, one of the first times for him and that basically the auditor immediately ended session because that's what you're supposed to do in session if someone says they're exterior you immediately end the session and he he said he couldn't figure out how to control his body while exterior and the auditor had ended the session and he was having to stand up and walk down the hallway to go to the examiner to make sure his needle was floating and he was having trouble walking down the hallway like he was holding on to the side of the wall trying to figure out how to control his body because he was exterior to it and he was having to learn it. Now, this guy was a freaking rocket scientist. He wasn't some crazy hippie. No offense to hippies. He wasn't, he wasn't you know, he wasn't taking LSD on the weekends. He was an intelligent, educated academic scientist and this is the story i'm hearing but you can also say that genius and madness are often close together aaron in the history uh, in the world history of spirituality 
there's all kinds of experiences high and low you can have that are disorienting, destabilizing, terrifying. You know, out of body uh, experiences are certainly one of them. So in and of itself, it's uh, some sort of phenomena he had. Right. Uh, it could be a hallucination. It could be explained a lot of ways. The point is that that intellectual intelligence and uh, various what we could call it materialistic brain phenomena, you have an actual spiritual experience, whatever, they don't always go together. Right. So Scientology, we certainly know, is not rational. And this is why they have the introspection rundown, because if this guy had started freaking out, they would have locked him up like Lisa McPherson to chill him out. Yeah, yeah, no question. So, so, but, uh, so the perspective I want to give here is that hearing stories like that regularly in Scientology is what led me to lean more in the direction of, damn, there's got to be something wrong with me. I wish I could, I wish that would happen to me. Like, shit, what's wrong? You know, um, and I never spent much time in Scientology thinking there was something wrong with me. But if I ever did, it was because of this exteriorization issue. <laughs> and I, I suspect that's a very root cause. And I also noticed on your freeloader bill that you had a lot of auditing. Does it say that? <laughs> well, well, I mean, if you look at, uh, I may be looking at your wife's site. I'm seeing a charge for, it just simply says, auditing thirty eight thousand dollars oh yeah because that's that that's your wife yeah she's had a yeah she had a lot of auditing yeah no but but not bridge it, auditing like i don't that's where I, I know this can get confusing to 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 non-scientologists who who pay attention there's so much auditing that happens that has nothing to do with the bridge um and you know my wife spent most of her time in the sea org um as someone who had attested to the state of clear um, there's a ton, a ton, a ton of auditing that someone has to get between the point that they attest to clear and when they're ever allowed to start OT1. Um, and a lot of that auditing is sec checking and pulling overs and withholds. And so my wife probably spent most of this $38,000 getting sec checking. And then not only sec checking, but there's a, a, an advanced form of sec checking called the false purpose rundown, FPRD which is every time you get off an overt and you run the overt back to the earliest time you committed a similar overt, you then have to find the evil purpose or destructive intention that caused you to commit that overt and then um, find, go earlier similar, uh, meaning an earlier similar time you had that evil purpose or destructive intention to the very first time, usually millions and billions of years ago, until you you get rid of the evil purpose that caused you to commit those overts. and. And this is all done in preparation for getting onto OT1 with the idea being you have to be like the most ethical being possible to be allowed onto the OT levels. So you get hundreds of hours of false purpose rundown. And that's why my wife got all this auditing. Now, shortly before we left the Sea Org, they then said, oops, you're not clear. And then, so- No, wait, wait, stop right there. <laughs> they're, they're, they're getting ready to get your wife to be uh, a pure, Satan, mm -hmm. who's, who's passed all her evil purposes, and then they go, oops, you're not clear after all. Yeah, well, it's not like they told her that as a result of the auditing. Um, there was a whole movement that happened in Scientology at a specific time uh, at the direction of David Miscavige to take everyone who had ever been attested to pass life clear and tell them that they were not clear. <laughs> <laughs> and I, like I said, most people my age in Scientology who were on staff or in the Sea Org who were clear had attested to past life clear. Um, you have to get so much auditing to go clear the right, the normal way. When I say normal way, I mean go through all of the grades, all of new era Dianetics. I mean, it's hundreds of hours of freaking auditing. No one's going to get that much auditing. It, it costs tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars. So the people my age who were clear, they were all last life clear. And a lot of the people who were on OT7 had attested to past life clear. And li literally hundreds and more accurately thousands of people in Scientology who had attested to clear um, between uh, 2002 and 2006 were told they were not clear. But statistically, if you counted the number of Scientologists in the 50s, mm -hmm. 
the number of people in that era who attested to past life clear would exceed the number of Scientologists in the 1950s. That's probably true, but uh, mathematical things like that are just an inconvenient truth. <laughs> well, uh, well, granted, Harvard was never good with clock mathematics. Right. So they, they invalidated all these past life clears. Right. Let's set something up here. Because this is really an interesting investigation into Scientology mysticism, mm -hmm. Scientology auditing, and Sea Org indoctrination. So in the middle of you wondering why you've never been exterior, you're having to do your day-to-day -day life as a Sea Org uh, officer. Mm -hmm. Member, I was never an officer, but go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. So, you so, so you're having to do your regular job as a Sea Org member. Mm -hmm. And that means bring in the money every week, right? I was delivering the services, but other people brought in the money. Okay, <laughs> okay but you're anyway. You're doing. You're you're working full time. You're striving toward enlightenment, right? And you, you're thinking you're doing the greatest good. Mm -hmm. So circling back in our interview, you're very disillusioned once you understand the clear cognition. Mm -hmm. Does it seem self-defeating? Do you feel like you were ripped off, cheated, or lied to? The reason I don't feel ripped off, cheated, or lied to is because the, the time I spent on staffing in the Sea Org was a time I was basically getting life experience that no other kids my age were getting. And, I, and so that's why, even though I have some horrible stories to tell, I actually look back on that time and go, you know what? I took pretty much all of the positive that I possibly could take out of that time. So it's not like I read something like a clear cognition and I go, oh my God, I've wasted the last 50 years of my life. I, I got, by the time I left the Sea Org, I was, um, uh, I guess I was 26. Um, and I'd already had a lot of real world experience. So that's kind of a long answer. The short answer is no, I, I it wasn't quite that bad as far as like just being deceived or wasting my life or anything like that. It was more like, it was more like, Wow. Okay. okay. It, it, when I when I found out what the clear cognition was, it was around the same time that all of these high level former executives uh, were defecting from the church and speaking out publicly about all the about all the abuse. And I was paying a lot of attention to that, and I was getting really worked up about it. And I was like, man, everything that I've um, been taught to was true about in management, international management is totally bullshit. And so I was really wrapped up in just the lies that were happening within the organization. And when I read the clear cognition, I sort of backed up and I was like, oh, dude, I don't need to get so worked up about the lies within the organization. This whole fucking thing is a lie. I was like, are you kidding me? I just realized I've been mocking up my reactive mind and I'm not doing it anymore. That's the big freaking secret. That's the... You know, that's the, the, the state that Scientology creates in people that has never been achieved ever in the history of mankind. It's, it's a stupid fucking comment that someone might make after reading half of Dianetics. Like for me, it was almost a relief to go, oh, I don't have to spend so much time worrying about, well, this person lied about this and this person lied about this. I can just discard the entire subject as bullshit. And, and it, so it, it, it wasn't as devastating as you might think. It was almost the opposite. It was almost like, wow, it opened my eyes so quickly and so thoroughly that it was almost a relief. I mean, in, in a weird way. No, it's, it sounds like it was a big relief. Yeah. And the bottom line to, to finish up on our interview, you leave and you get hit. You and your wife, according to the spreadsheet, your, uh, what is it, hundred between you and your wife, $129,000 freeloader debt? Yeah, well, full price, hers was one twenty nine, mine was thirty two, so $162,000 and change. And you guys are in your mid-20s. How do you get $162,000? That could buy a house. Yeah, well, I was, yeah, I was 26, and uh, she was 34 at that time. And, um... Yeah, I mean, it's just one of those things where you're so happy to be out of the damn sea or you're not really giving a shit about your freeloader debt. <laughs> so so you basically ignored it. You said, I'm ignoring this? No, I mean, we had it paid within a year. We negotiated it down, and that's a whole other story. Aaron, I have to tell you, I'm really enjoying our interview. It's very wide-ranging, loosely constructed around a freeloader debt, but you've really taken us into some interesting things like the PTSSP course. You've taken us into Scientology Clear Cognition. This is really a dynamite interview. What I'd like to do in part two, 
with you is to talk about how you paid your freeloader debt, how you negotiated it, and then have you speak to people who are looking at their own free, freeloader debt. How about that? Sure. Okay, then we will do it on part two. For Surviving Scientology Radio, this is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Thank you for listening, and as always, we'll be in very good touch.